Thanks to Peter for the introduction that I is uh, filled aside. And Sarah Price and I are going to be discussing ethical issues associated with the use of technology. We're hoping to provide you with some very practical applications associated with technology when you're advising your clients and when you're um, uh, also listening to the information that's being provided by your clients. Uh, I think that uh, the internet has really kind of revolutionized how it is that we practice law. Everything from uh, in King County, we have mandatory e filing requirements to send emails to our clients to be able to get information, communicating back and forth with your, with your client. Um, technology has really kind of changed the way that we practice law. It's a revolution, and I think that revolution is ongoing. Um, when we talk about uh, technology, uh, for today's purpose, though, because that's a very vast uh, word in terms of this, we're really going to be talking about uh, four areas. Um, we're going to be talking about issues with social media, and we're going to be discussing issues associated with lawyer advertising and websites. Uh, we're going to be talking about listservs. I'm sure that there are many members uh, of, the, uh, of the bar who are members of listservs and use those. And then I touch on uh, cloud computing as well. So the first thing that I thought that was important to understand with respect to technology and, and social media is what is social media? Um, I was able to, when doing some research for this presentation, uh, find uh, something that I thought was appropriate. It's, it was by the guidelines and best practices for social media in Washington State that was provided by uh, the Office of the Governor uh, in terms of you know, uh, employees in the state of Washington and, and what would be a good practice with respect to social media and what wouldn't be. Um, this particular definition I thought was very good and applicable because it states that interaction with <coughs> external websites or services based on participant, uh, participant contributions to the content. And I think that that's why it is that uh, uh, so some of these social media sites are so popular today is, is that anybody can participate from their internet, on their computer, to be able to have information be provided to uh, many people, uh, whether it's a hundred or a thousand people that you're able to communicate with using the internet. Uh, this is something that I think that is important because of that specific factor of participant contribution. So what are we talking about then when we're, uh, when we're talking about social media? These are things like uh, blogs, microblogs, social and professional networks, uh, videos or, or photo sharing, social bookmarking, and some of these things that we're talking about specifically, I'm sure everybody's familiar with. The first would be Facebook. So I'd like to take a poll of the people in the seminar today. How many people out there actually do have a Facebook page? Okay, probably a better question to ask would be how many people don't have a Facebook page? <laughs> okay, actually there's there's quite a few of you. Um, this is what I'd, I'd like to make sure that everybody understands what we're talking about. And so I'm going to briefly describe each one of these uh, types of social media. Facebook is a page that you can go on and you can create a user profile. And with that user profile, you're able to put all kinds of information, a picture of yourself, uh, things that you like that you don't like, you can describe your educational background. Uh, it's a way to be able to express yourself on the internet. And so when you create the Facebook page, then you've got your profile page. What you can do with that then is, and what's really popular about Facebook, is you can invite people to be your friends. And that's what it's all about. So you invite people to be your friends, and then uh, you can see their profile page. And as your friends grow, we all want to have a lot of friends, uh, your network becomes larger and larger. And as a result of that, then you have this large network of, of friends. Facebook also has what's called a news feed. And on the news feed, you're able to uh, post information about a topic, anything that you want to put on there within the, the, the rules and guidelines of the, of the uh, page itself. But you can put specific information on there. The more friends that you have on Facebook, then, the larger your news feed becomes. And uh, the thing that's really uh, important about that is, is that you are the one contributing to the content associated with it. If you have a 1,000 friends on Facebook, and they have other friends, it just grows exponentially in terms of what information can be seen by other people uh, who have access to the internet. Another um, a specific social media site is Twitter. How many people out there have a Twitter page? Okay, how many people don't have a Twitter page? Okay. So there's a lot of people uh, who don't have Twitter pages. Twitter's a little bit different in that it's really um, something that, that, that is used to build a kind of a, a news flash. Uh, they're called tweets. And what you do is you put about 140 characters. You're limited to how much uh, information that you can put on Twitter. About 140 characters. You can send it out, and people follow you on Twitter. And you can follow other people on Twitter. So it's just another way that people are able to talk to one another without necessarily face-to-face -face contact, without having telephone contact. You can communicate with 
one another uh, in a way that is, uh, that is more revolutionary today using the internet. Um, another one of these social media sites is MySpace. Uh, how many people out there have a MySpace page? How many people don't have a MySpace page? Okay. Uh, MySpace is very, very similar in terms of that you know you create a user profile, you can put information onto the uh, to the to the website uh, that describes yourself. Um, you can invite other people to be friends. You can have them follow you on MySpace. MySpace is used for music, I think, you know, predominantly after these other um, uh, more recent uh, social media sites that have come out, like Facebook. Um, oh. But it's another way that people are able to communicate with one another. And I think that's the key, is that we're seeing a, a great prevalence in terms of that. Uh, YouTube is another one of the social media sites. Um, how many people have a YouTube uh, video that's at least out on the internet? <laughs> so it looks like a lot of people do have uh, uh, YouTube pages that are up there as well. You can put anything you want, again, within the restrictions and the confines of what it is that YouTube says that you, that you can do and can't do. Um, and it can be anything from a, an instructional video to you know, marketing yourself as an attorney uh, to putting your daughter's dance recital on, onto YouTube. Um, two other sites that I'd like to discuss are, are LinkedIn and Avo. Um, I think that those sites are really more predominantly for uh, networking for professionals. Um, you put your educational background. You have information that you can share with other uh, Avo users and LinkedIn users. Avo, of course, rates doctors and lawyers. You can claim your profile page on Avo, and once you've done that, you can put additional information onto that website that lets people know who you are, what your area of practice is, uh, and so forth. Um, so, uh, also, people like to use blogs. I'm sure that everybody's familiar with that term. Uh, there's been a lot of news media about, uh, about blogs uh, recently. And then also um, RSS feeds, which uh, blog just stands for weblog, and RSS feeds, which are just really simple syndications, uh, a way to be able to get a news flash out there again so that people can see them. You can get email notification that a uh, an RSS feed has come in. You can then look at that RSS feed to really get information for the different areas that you have uh, requested. So how is it that ethics interact with social media? Uh, the first is, I think, uh, uh, RBC 1.1 competence, and, and everybody knows this RBC, and it provides that a lawyer shall provide competent representation to a client, and the competent representation requires the legal knowledge, skill, and thoroughness, and reasonable preparation necessary for that representation. So having information about these particular social media sites in this day and age, I think, is very important for us to be able to meet that specific requirement. Uh, one of the specific um, comments to RPC 1.1 states that to maintain that requisite skill and knowledge, that a lawyer should keep abreast of changes in the law and its practice. And given the fact that uh, these social media websites are so prevalent in today's society, I think it's important for us as family law practitioners to be able to have an understanding as to how these sites work. Um, and of course, diligence, RPC 1.3 states that a lawyer shall act with reasonable diligence and promise in representing a client. In this context, I think that uh, both diligence and competence apply to these social media sites, and let me tell you why. The most recent statistic that I was able to find with respect to the number of Facebook users is that there are over 500 million Facebook users. That's a staggering amount of people who are using this particular type of, type of social media to be able to communicate with one another. And of that, over 200 million of those people have it on their mobile phone uh, that they can take with them. So really what people are able to do is, anywhere they're at, they can use uh, their mobile phones to be able to use Facebook and post things. You can take a picture anywhere that you're at, you can put it on Facebook, and everyone in the network of friends that you have uh, is able to see them, okay? Also, pursuant to the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers, they're seeing about an 81% increase in the amount of social media websites being used in family law cases. I think that, uh, and they report that actually 66% of those people report that Facebook is the primary source for what they're, what they're using. So I think that, you know, based on the number of people who are using uh, Facebook and some of the statistics that have been provided by the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers, that's important for attorneys to be able to understand how it is that these uh, uh, sites are working. And let me give you some practical examples about that. Um, if your opposing counsel in a case is going to be submitting evidence, either at trial for impeachment purposes or if they're going to be submitting uh, Facebook pages onto um, you know, declarations for the motions calendar, if you don't have an understanding as to how it is that those were obtained, if you don't have an understanding about how it is the practical applications associated with Facebook, 
it's going to be very difficult for you to, to make evidentiary objections to those. Um, sometimes there is evidence that would be provided that absolutely was uh, obtained in a way that you know was unethical, and it shouldn't have been. <coughs> you may be able to make those kinds of objections if you understand how it is that these websites actually work. Um, for example, uh, if there's a restraining order in a case, and it states that there should be no contact between the spouses, that the spouses, given the prevalent number of people who are using Facebook, start to contact one another by posting onto Facebook. Is that a violation of a restraining order that would be in, in place? Um, Facebook has a specific type of uh, way that you can nudge somebody. It's called poking them. And it's just basically a way that if somebody hasn't been using Facebook for a while, that it can say, hey, um, I'd like you to use this again. And, but, it's, but it's instigated by one of the parties who are using the website. So would that be something that would be a violation of a restraining order? Another example would be that if you've got a parenting plan in place that uh, states that neither one of the parents should make disparaging remarks about the other uh, parent. And let's say that your child, for example, is of an age in which they're able to have a uh, Facebook page. And they start to make derogatory comments because our clients do like to vent. Um, that would be something that uh, also, you know, having an understanding about how it is that these uh, uh, web pages work is something that I think is critical to the family law practitioner today. Another issue related to, uh, to social media is, is confidentiality. And I think that um, it's very easy and alluring. And this is more you know, kind of geared towards the attorney who has a Facebook page and maybe using Facebook as a way to be able to communicate with their colleagues or friends or family members. Um, it seems like uh, there are a lot of people who are using the social media sites, and we're not immune from that at all. Um, the number of people who have Facebook pages in the seminar today is an example of that. But it's very easy for us to be able to forget that when we send something out on the internet, that it's difficult for you to go get it back. And in fact, I would say that once you've sent it out into the internet, if you've posted something on a Facebook page, uh, it's, it's likely that there are going to be people who are going to see that that you don't want to have seen that. So it's important you know, to, to consider the uh, ethical implications associated with using Facebook. Um, there are many examples out in the media today of, of lawyers who have actually used Facebook to their detriment, and what I would describe as, as poor use of social media. Um, I gave an example in the material that was provided uh, that specified uh, there was an Illinois criminal defense attorney, and they used the jail roster number, the attorney used the jail roster number for her client, and started to post things on Facebook, things that I would view as being confidential, things that shouldn't have been posted on Facebook, um, using a way essentially to vent. And I think as family law practitioners, uh, we deal with a very difficult area of the law because it's highly emotionally charged. We may want to vent, and we probably will talk to our colleagues or you know, other people that would be appropriate for that to worry about reaching that duty of confidentiality. But uh, under circumstances in which, for example, this criminal defense attorney, um, this defense attorney started to blog almost daily with respect to how uh, uh, Set of competences of her client, um, talking about uh, uh, facts of the case that shouldn't have been divulged, and then also was making derogatory comments towards the judge in cases that you know, she had had. Um, that resulted essentially in the Illinois Board recommending that you know, she be disbarred as a result of that. So there are other examples in the material that we provided uh, with respect to poor use of social media. It's very important for the family law attorney to be able to understand how this works. The ease by which Facebook can be used and then we communicate with other people uh, makes it you know, very difficult sometimes to think about what it is that you're doing when you're using these social media websites. Um, you know, that's a very easy example, this, this Illinois you know, criminal defense attorney, as to what not to do. But there could be other things that would be more subtle that you might do on Facebook that you don't think that would be a violation of your confidentiality rule. Uh, they could be, um, for example, just you know, saying where it is that your location is on your kind of new client. Twitter has uh, a way to be able to, to determine where you're actually located if you tweet something uh, using your mobile phone. Um, Facebook has Facebook places that also would allow you to reveal the location of where you're at. And even that, the fact that you're revealing who it is that your client is could be something that you should be cautious about and careful if you're going to use, use these social media websites. So, you know, venting on social media for attorneys it can have consequences. Um, you should be very careful about the things that you're, that you're saying. If you're using Facebook as part of your practice or otherwise, information that's posted on the internet, be careful about because it could be permanent. And people who don't necessarily want to have uh, access to, to the things that you're 
mostly may have access to it, 